The opening ceremony of a parliament is a very impressive affair. Here in Western Australia, it involves all the political leaders, judges, top-ranking officers from the armed forces, church leaders and civic leaders. It symbolises the continuance and stability of our democratic institutions. In the Westminster Parliament in London, the official opening by the Sovereign is of course even grander. Tradition, pomp and ceremony all come together to underline the perception that a Parliament is a place deserving of respect. So why, for many members of the public, is the actual perception of Parliament something like this? Most members of the public are unaware that members of the Parliament spend only less than half the year meeting in the Parliament. The bulk of their time is spent in their electorate office or driving, or flying around their electorate, or, if they are a minister, in their ministerial office helping to draft new laws. So why all the shouting? One reason might be frustration. The opposition has very limited control over what happens in the Parliament. That control is in the hands of the government and the presiding officers, the Speaker here and the President in the Upper House. Moving from opposition to government is a daunting but rewarding experience. Moving from government to opposition presents a very different challenge. Well, obviously, like everybody, I was devastated uh, with the result uh, and I lost many friends and colleagues in the recent election. But uh, it is what it is um, and we need to rebuild and we need to regroup. And I am looking forward uh, to playing my part in opposition uh, over the next four years. In some ways, it's a very good training ground. Um, you learn very much the processes uh, of Parliament, asking questions, being part of uh, debates, a whole range of things. So I've had the opportunity uh, to come in as op in opposition, uh, then in government and in opposition again. And I suppose even just saying that, it just goes to show how the system changes and, and governments change over a period of time. And, um, you know, I'm, I will do my part. An election campaign gives the members of the public the chance to hold the candidates to account. I actually found people are generally quite forgiving uh, if you have genuinely done your best. I think they can spot it a lot of the time if you're faking it or, or just telling them what they want to hear to get them out of the office. I think people, particularly if they're dealing directly with you, as long as they feel like they have been heard. Uh, I used to patiently run them through the steps of what I could do to follow up. Uh, sometimes we would deliver some outstanding results and sometimes we wouldn't. We'd never promise an outcome. We would promise them that we would follow up their request through the steps that I would outline for them in a meeting uh, and we would seek to get the best outcome that we could. So I actually generally found people were not disappointed. Question time is what the public think the parliament is all about. But it is only 45 minutes of the parliamentary day. Ultimately, it could be described as a game of confidence. There is a lot of theatre in question time. It is a chance for the opposition to unsettle the government and try to undermine their confidence. Question time can give the perception that the parliament has descended into a shambles, but there is a method in the madness. The opposition is trying to land a knockout blow to the government, and question time is one of the best opportunities to try that, because the television and newspaper reporters are all watching and waiting for something dramatic to happen. But if that is all you see reported about what goes on in Parliament, then it is not surprising that many people have a very negative view of Parliament and its members. Uh, reporters need to get, we need to get stories. We need to find out what's going on in government, what's going on in political parties, and we've got to be able to speak to politicians and, and I guess to some, in, in some extent get their confidence in, in some areas, but through politicians get the stories to uh, tell readers, viewers and listeners. So we both need each other. Although uh, it must be noted with the fracturing of the, uh, of the media, with the social media, different ways, tweeting, different ways of getting messages out, perhaps uh, there is a, a starting to be a breakdown between, uh, between political reporters and, and politicians. So that, because, I mean, you might have seen it in question time. Uh, politicians are uh, uh, tweeting all through question time. To, to sort of various followers. So uh, they're bypassing the traditional media. So there, is, there, there are things starting to change 
uh, and uh, perhaps it's a move away from politicians needing journalists all the time, but uh, I don't think that relationship will break completely. So why doesn't the public see more of what else happens in Parliament? The reason is perhaps that what happens during the rest of the day, although very important, is not as interesting from the public's point of view. Presenting petitions and reports, consideration and detail, grievances all sound pretty dull. Parliament is where the laws that govern us are made. But how does an idea become a policy brought in by the government and then go on to become a law? An example is the Hoons Bill, brought in by the Barnett government in 2016. We've um, implemented a, a range of initiatives around Hoons. So when we first came to government, we changed the empowerment and confiscation rules. So for a person caught um, hooning for a first offence, they have their vehicle impounded for a month. On a second offence, it's for three months. On a third offence, we take and confiscate the vehicle permanently. Overwhelmingly, when I went out into the community, the thing that people complained about most was the home vehicles. And that's because they're really worried about it. When they hear tyres screeching and squealing, they, they, they're concerned that that vehicle's going to come hurtling through their lounge room. And one particular example, I was out in High Wycombe, and uh, there was a major road, Newburn Road, a primary school. Uh, the local government had put in some traffic modification systems in there, so a speed hump and a few other things. It was a 40 kilometre per hour school zone with flashing school um, signage. And after those speed humps went in, what the hoons in that area would do, when the school was in session as well, I might add, when parents are bringing their children to and from school and the crossing guard was there, is they would park on top of the speed hump and use it as a launching ramp to take off down the road. So out of that, we decided that behaviour was so inherently dangerous that there needed to be a particularly harsh consequence for those individuals. So the Hoon legislation um, we introduced was for specific circumstances, hooning in a 40 kilometre per hour, an active school zone or a 50 kilometre per hour limited zone. Uh, if you're charged with one of those Hoon offences, reckless driving, um, you'll have your vehicle impounded on the first offence. However, it needs to be an application to the court for that consequence. This is the first reading of the bill, simply a minister asking the parliament to present a new bill. Now this is an example of how the Hoon's bill went on to become a law. Mr. Speaker, I move that the bill now be read a second time. The road traffic amendment impounding and confiscation of vehicles Excuse bill. me, Minister. Members, I think you may need to take your conversations outside the chamber so that we can hear this. Thank you, Minister. Acting Speaker, the Road Traffic Amendment Impounding and Confiscation of Vehicles Bill 2016 contains measures to address the reckless use of motor vehicles on our roads. Broadly, this bill amends the Road Traffic Act 1974, Road Traffic Act and associated legislation to provide additional powers for a court to confiscate a vehicle used to commit an impounding offence driving or as these are colloquially known, a hoon offence. If a bill or proposed law passes the lower house, it must now be submitted to the upper house for their consideration. And the whole process starts again. First reading, second reading, third reading. If it passes the upper house, it goes to the governor who signs it on behalf of the queen. And it is now a law. I said, if it passes, because the upper house is under no obligation to pass a bill. If the Upper House and the Western Australian Parliament refuses to pass a bill, there is nothing the Lower House can do about it. Unlike in the Federal Parliament, where if the Senate refuses to pass a bill twice, the House of Representatives, the Lower House, can call for an election. What happens, of course, that every piece of legislation has to pass through both houses, but all money bills have to be introduced in the Legislative Assembly, the Lower House, and then that those bills are then transferred to the Upper House, the Legislative Council, the Red Chamber, and the Red Chamber, the Legislative Council, can in fact not amend such a bill, but it can reject them. So the Legislative Council can reject the money bills, the major budget item for the state. But not only that, the Legislative Council assumes its seats at 
on the 22nd of May, well, in 2017, and it has a four-year term till the 21st of May, 2021. The house cannot be removed or dissolved. So if it says and votes to reject supply, they can force a government to the polls without going themselves. It has been said that the Western Australian Legislative Council is the most powerful upper house in Australia. Did you know that in a Westminster Parliament such as ours here in Western Australia, members on opposite sides must stand so far apart that their swords cannot touch? This comes from the days long ago when the members would wear their swords into Parliament and they had to be kept a certain distance apart in case a fight broke out. If you got too close to a member opposite, the speaker would shout out, toe the line, which meant put your toe behind the line. But a parliament is not just about arguing and bluff and bluster. Sometimes it is about all the members coming together in agreement about a particular issue. A really good example of this was the apology to unmarried mothers motion debated in the Western Australian Parliament in 2010. Another example is the Constitutional Recognition of Aboriginal People Bill 2015. This was a private member's bill introduced by the member for Kimberley, Josie Farrar, to recognise the Aboriginal people as the traditional owners of the land. The bill received great support from both sides of the House. In 2012, a motion concerning the Kimberley Ultramarathon was introduced and also received great support from both sides. So you see, the members can agree sometimes. In fact, they agree on many things. What they argue about is the detail, and that is their job. Great British parliamentarian and former Prime Minister Sir Winston Churchill said of the Westminster system was that it was the worst system, except for all the others. If a parliament is a mirror of the people, then it will possess all the imperfections and all the good and all the not so good that the people also possess. It can't help but be that way.